The boat is here. The goal is eventually to talk about fuel, top speed, and boost mechanics, but in order to do that, I need to take another guess at a pretty important game design element, and so this video is dedicated to modularity. I think a lot of folks are visiting Arena Commander and starting to imagine a component system like a lot of contemporary games use, which CIG isn't using at all. It seems this way in Arena Commander because CIG is modifying gear to give players a sense of how the ships might feel day one in the Persistent Universe. So the races are kitted out for racing, but the other ships are still in their knickers. The ships also have some arbitrary stats on them, like top speed, which will always be in the game, but will very likely not be determined by the ship you're in, but how the ship you're in is equipped. The ship's stats page is also misleading many players, as it gives the impression the ship hulls have their own unique attributes, when in the Persistent Universe the ship is defined by how it's equipped. Some hulls will have better ratio of component space for engines and power plants, and it will be easier to have high acceleration and top speed in those ships, for instance. But the stats aren't attributes of the ships, just what space they have set aside for components. The type of system most gamers have gotten really familiar with is where a class has attributes and values on its own, and then gear gets added to make it better. These are arbitrary, whimsical, or contrived systems, usually. Here is an example of an arbitrary system. You take a class, like Warrior, and add a piece of equipment that gives bonuses to the Warrior's stats. You make more gear with better bonuses, usually the gear keeps getting better, giving players a sense of progression. Next, you add another class, you add gear for that class that helps set it apart from the first class. The gear is just connected to the class it's made for, and doesn't have much in common with the gear for the other class, it just goes in the same place and is called Boots. The gear can have any number of bonuses and modifiers, but it's still just arbitrarily modifying a class that already has its own stats. I think a lot of people are assuming this same type of system for Star Citizen. They get a ship with stats and some basic gear. They have to go and get better gear to put on the ship to modify the ship's stats. Once they have the best gear, they have to get a better ship with better stats to keep progressing. They get a new ship, and it has better gear because it's a better ship, and even assume that the gear for the ship could be the same gear, but it's just better because it's a better ship. Then they get better gear for their new ship until it's time for a new better ship with even better gear. This is just linear progression and arbitrary gear, even if it's complex looking gear with a lot of stats. The only point of the gear is to make the ship better at whatever it does. The pitfall is that if the gear has to get better to make the ship better, it follows most other MMOs and level progression games where the player is rewarded by slowly powering up and removing gameplay elements to let the player feel powerful or accomplished. It also doesn't have to be related to gear from other ships because it's made up just to make its particular ship do its thing better. It just goes in the same place and is called Boots. The biggest problem with arbitrary systems is scale, and it always ends up with little conundrums like this. I'll let that breathe for a second. I think the reason this type of gear system gets used so often in games is because they're easy to understand and apply. It's not even really a system, it's just a whimsical method of making stuff different than better, and it doesn't have to make any sense. Like newspapers, it's designed to be easily understood by as many people as possible, and game publishers love this. It's great for K-12. through It appeals to a broad audience in that progression is clear and obvious. Boots get better, get better boots. The bottom line is that players have been buying it. Star Citizen is not going this route. It would be doing a 180 from its design principles where they made it pretty clear they're not using typical publisher-approved non-systems, but actual systems instead. Still, there are a lot of backers and video game players that have no experience with the old school tabletop battle simulations, so they've just never had exposure to this type of rule set. I'll take a crack at explaining how this kind of system might be applied to the Star Citizen universe. Uh, I'll keep it simple because in my experience the best game systems are simple and built from there. But as a quick caveat, I'm not saying what Star Citizen should be or trying to guess what CIG is doing. I'm just going to lay out a game system that is the same type of system that CIG has told us they are building. Also, when I say simple, I mean as simple as it could be and still work at all. The first thing we do is make rules. So a liter of water takes up this much space and has this much mass. We start with volume and determine mass. Volume is king in this type of system and mass is at its right hand or right hand. We start at the beginning. A ship ain't a ship until it's ready to fly. Until then, it's a blank slate. 
tabula rasa, pure potential, or a hole. Holes have volume, so holes have mass. All holes are related by the same standard. So keeping it simple, we take every ship model and determine its volume. Everything will be measured in cubic meters. Cubic meters are our unit of volume. So a volume of 10 is 10 cubic meters. Doesn't matter what shape it has, only that it occupies 10 cubic meters of space. These are just meter grids scaled over some ships so I could get a quick but reasonable idea of the volume of each hull. I'm just looking for an approximation of the space a hull has that stuff could be put. If I had to, I'd make five or six blocks, add up the area, and then make another simple block to represent the same approximate space. So I'll take the volume of each hull and put it on a list so we can keep track of everything. The volume of a hull determines its size. I have a simple table for that. Basically, as a ship gets bigger, it needs to have stronger struts and infrastructure to keep it from folding itself into a pretzel. So the parts of the hull we're converting to mass are a little denser on bigger ships. Next, we need to determine what the hull will be used for. Is it a parasite ship that docks with a larger ship to travel, like a racer or a fighter ship, space station support or planetary militia, a monosystem transport or support ship that relies on other ships to carry it through jump points, or a fully sustainable and self-reliant interstellar traveler? As the function of a ship increases, so does the mass of its base hull. Landing gear and gyros are the next issue. Landing gear will ignore. It's built into the ship. It can't be changed or modified. We'll assume it's part of the volume to mass calculation. We'll assume the same for gyros, but because gyros are potentially a big gameplay element for stealth ships, cargo haulers, and ships that would otherwise be crippled or derelict without maneuvering thrusters, we'll have a minimum accounting for this and allocate part of the volume of the ship, depending on its size, to gyros. These could be upgraded later, so all ships have a way to adjust their attitude without using thrusters, and could increase this ability through upgrades. Since we are determining the mass of hulls, we cannot use their volume directly to determine mass, because the hulls are containers for components, or mostly empty space, so we'll use a combination of surface and total volume. We'll give the ship a credit to mass for interior space since it's not volume that needs infrastructure for housing components. It's empty space until it's converted for cargo, living space, or additional component space. So, volume is the space a hull approximately occupies. Hull size is determined by volume and makes the hull's mass slightly higher as hull size increases. Hull class also increases hull mass and can be changed for each hull depending on what the owner of the hull wants to use the hull for. Gyros have volume and take away from hull space, which is where we will eventually put components and is based on hull mass. It is a required part of the hull. Interior space is unused volume in the hull and will be used for cargo space, living quarters, or additional components. Interior space is subtracted from hull space but is not added to hull mass. Hull space is where we put all the components. This is where we will find size 2 shields, size 4 engines, and all the stuff that is making people bonkers over the stats. Surface is the square meters of the hull's volume and represents paneling and bulkheads. Hull mass is figured by multiplying surface by 13, volume minus interior space by 7, uh, then applies the whole size modifiers to surface, the whole class modifier to volume, minus interior space, then adds them all together, whole mass in a neat little tabletop package. The irony is not lost on me that the numbers I multiplied surface and volume by are arbitrary, whimsical, and contrived. The difference is that whatever numbers I pick, the holes are still directly related to each other by the system. Next we need to allocate whole space to components and all that stuff that makes a whole a ship. To do this, we need another system. This is a grid with a cube on it. Each of the grid squares represents a half a meter. So this is a cube, one meter by one meter by one meter. A size one component is one meter cubed. But since we want a wide variety of components, and not all holes have the same space available for a component, we'll allow some wiggle room for a component to qualify for size one stats. A size 1 component can be from 0.5 to 3 cubic meters. 1 cubic meter is a volume of 1. A component that fits in this box would be a volume 1 size 1 component. A size 2 component gets half a meter bigger for each of its dimensions. This makes a size 2 component 1.5 meters cubed, or about 3 cubic meters. 
or just volume 3. Size 3 increases the dimensions of the box by another half meter, making the median volume for a size 3 component 2 meters cubed, or about 8 cubic meters. Every size 2 component could be as small as volume 1, so as small as the median volume for the size category below it, or as big as the median volume above it. Each size category applies a new filter to the volume of a component, slightly changing the stats of the component. Each component's size filter will have its own modifiers, depending on the component, but will generally become more efficient as the component gains volume and size. The size filters continue in the same fashion up to size 8, but a size 9 would just be half a meter bigger box on each side to determine the next median size. The actual shape of the components is irrelevant. What does matter is the component fits into the space allocated for it on the hole it is being installed. Different components will need different shapes depending on the hole it is being put into, but some could be fairly standard, and all that matters is the amount of space it occupies. We'll use these rules to allocate space on each hole we created hole space for, and designate space for power plants, engines, thrusters, and shields based on CIG's ship stats page, and keep track of how much of the holes available hole space we've used on the spreadsheet. Yes, I rounded size 6 to 42 instead of 43. I do stuff like that. We'll walk through one ship and run through the rest. Tiers and sizes are the same thing in these tabletop rules. The Aurora needs a size 3 engine. We won't be finicky. We're still using cubic meter blocks to allocate space. It needs to be about 8 cubic meters of space, or volume 8. Bam. We put that on the spreadsheet and move on to power plant. We'll keep parts contiguous, meaning they have to be all one block. A size 5 power plant can't be in 5 different places on the ship, because then it would be 5 size 2 or 3 power plants. So far, size 1 maneuvering thrusters have been little nozzles on the hull, so I'm not making tiny boxes for these, but I'm putting them on the spreadsheet because they take up volume. We can get size for shield too, so we add that. We'll go right down the list with batteries, coolers, and intakes, even though they aren't listed as stats, the ship's resource pipelines won't function without them. We won't let any component overlap, but some will be slightly out of the whole space box. We'll take small liberties with the ship model in space, but account for everything on the spreadsheet, so we can't go over in volume what we have allotted for whole space. I'll do the same thing for each ship I made a schematic for. I'm not going to make a lot of rules for other parts required to make a hole into a ship in this video, but we're going to allocate space for them nonetheless. Since even our crew stations are quite possibly modular components, we'll need to allocate space for these as well. Each crew station takes away two volume from the hull space, even if it's located in interior space. It'll make more sense later why we do this if you don't already follow. We'll add life support as well, and allocate space for that based on crew and interior space, and even allocate space for quantum and jump drives for ships that are supposed to be jump capable, even if we didn't designate the whole class for jump capability. An M50 racer wouldn't need a jump reinforced hull, but an M50 has space allocated for a jump drive if the player wanted to upgrade the whole class to use one. Fuel. Pretty much the whole reason I started guessing at some of the game rules was to talk about this, so we're allocating space in each hull for a place to put it. Avionics has to be connected to everything in the ship, and will be one of the densest components, as it's not so much a humongous computer, but hundreds to thousands of meters shielded wiring connecting various processors, which could be anywhere, to everything. So we'll make sure all of our holes have some space allocated to a brain right away, and tweak it later if we decide to use this model for a little avionics theory crafting. In this example, we're differentiating components and units. Components apply to the hole, while units apply to the component. A cooler for an engine or power plant is a cooling unit, and a battery applied to a component is a capacitor, but we're not going to get around to that in this video. We'll also allocate some space for sensors, though I'm pretty sure they will have a system of their own in terms of volume and mass, seeing how they can be mounted externally on hardpoints already. We're not even going to touch on hardpoints, mounts, and weapons, or even pylons on this video, as it's just an example of a shipbuilding system that follows rules for components. Speaking of which, let's make some now that we have rules for keeping them all in line and places to put them once we've made them. The first thing to do is find out the volume of the component we are making, so we measure it on each side to determine its volume, and we find we have a volume of 2. Next we decide what the archetype is for the component. Let's pick engine because we all have some idea of the basic attributes for this type of item. 
Next, we need to determine its size. We already know that a volume two component can be either size one or two, but let's see what the size filters do to a volume two engine before we decide which size it will be. These are basically rift attributes and stats for this example, but we'll give an idea of what a size filter does to the volume of a component. The size one filter makes the engine dense and powerful, but very costly. And the size two filter makes it less powerful, but more efficient. So it has less consumption, but also lower output and waste. After we apply the filter to the volume, we can see that the size one engine has more mass, but also more force applied per kilogram, costs more power and generates a lot more heat. And the size two is less mass, but less powerful fuel, or less power, fuel, and heat. Uh, so in general, the advantage of a higher size component is that it's safer and more manageable uh, to operate, while lower size components are a lot more volatile and violent. Let's go forward with the economical version, apply the size 2 filter, and now we have a volume 2 size 2 engine. We'll apply one more filter and run it through a manufacturer. So let's say Dragon makes more efficient engines that tend to have a bit more mass, and Hammer makes higher output engines with higher consumption, but their designs also tend to generate a little less heat. We apply the filter to the engine, and now we have two engines that are relatively balanced in stats, but made for two different things. Any filters applied to components should be give and take. So if something gets better, something else gets worse. Again, we'll go with the economical version and choose Dragon's size 2 volume 2 engine. Finally, we pick which hull this engine is modeled for from a list of ships that have enough hull space to equip a size 2 volume 2 engine, and might actually do so. We'll go with the M50. The M50 would equip two of these, but the final step after creating a component is to model the engine to fit the space of the hole we picked. So Dragon designs their volume two size two engine to fit Origins M50, and a component is born. That's it for this video. I'm pretty sure if you're one of the three people that watch this, you're only mildly interested in how it all fits together, but I'm gonna make that video anyway. If you made it this far, you might also have noticed that some of the things changed as the video went along. I'm pretty much building the example as I go, and spent more time trying to explain it than putting it together. In the next video, I'll flesh out some of the components, figure out how they work together, and take a crack at translating it to gameplay. Again, it's just an example of a type of system. This is likely a pretty grossly simplified version of CIG's system, but we haven't had a lot of info on how the development on that is going. So I started guessing from curiosity and figured, I'd share how the type of system CIG has said their building would work in Star Citizen. After ships start getting put together, I'll show how this type of system really shines in terms of ship variety compared to the linear progression a lot of people seem to be hoping for. I really do think the only reason so many people expect or seem to want the linear progression is because a lot of new gamers or people who only play video games have never had the opportunity to play with this kind of system. So I hope to show what CIG means when they say every ship has the potential to be your own personal Millennium Falcon or Firefly class Serenity. Thanks for watching. Neb out.